Okay. Today it's my pleasure to introduce Brother Sid Henderson. He and his wife Joy have come here as uh, missionaries serving on campus. Um, Sid is helping in the Career Center, but he's also the chaplain on campus. Uh, we have a chaplain. There, we, all, we know there's many that come to this campus that may not be LDS and they need um, to have an ecclesiastical endorsement and he helps work some of those things out as well as his other assignment in the Career Center. I've got to know Sid and Joyce a little bit during the last year or so. Um, let me tell you a little bit about Sid and his wife. They have, they're right now hailing from Utah, but actually they've lived in many countries, uh, from Argentina to the Middle East uh, to Africa. Uh, he served as a mission president in Tacoma, Washington. Um, they served as mission presidency. I know that's definitely a two person assignment to do that. He's uh, been involved with contract management in, for Saudi Arabia American Oil Company. He's been an executive for a large multinational marketing company as the managing producer, product development, and later product supply chain. He has been very strong, he and actually his son have been very strong in helping uh, help bring and strengthen our SAP um, implementation and coursework that we have here at BYU Hawaii. For those of you that may be taking some classes, uh, that's a great thing and maybe he'll talk a little bit about that. I'm not certain all of well, where he'll do that. One of the great things though that Sid has done is he's led a humanitarian project which today feeds over a hundred thousand hungry children every day in Africa and Asia. I think that's really admirable for that work that's been going on. Um, again, uh, Sid and Joyce have seven children, 21 grandchildren. So please welcome, join me in welcoming Sid Henderson as our guest lecturer today. Well, this is going to be hard. I, I've got all these pictures and movies to show you, but it isn't going to happen. <laughs> So uh, can you uh, take notes or uh, imagine or something? And I'll try to uh, cover some <coughs> things that I have found in my career have been very important. I, I appreciate this opportunity. <coughs> Heavenly Father has blessed me with a wonderful career and, uh, and it has made me very rich. And I want to tell you about that. Uh, I uh, just to kind of take take the introduction just a tad further. I just maybe tell you a few other things of interest that Sister Henderson and I have been involved in, and especially my my own personal experience. Uh, like uh, Brother Tanner said, I've I've worked uh, all over the world, and and I have uh, worked with people from all over the world. I've had I've had. Uh, oh, we lost this. That's important. Let's see if I can get this fixed. What I do? Okay. I have worked for five employers in my life, and in about I was trying to count today about twelve positions, and these positions really migrated and changed, and have uh, been different over from from one position to the other. Uh, and I think that's that's important. Two, I've quit my work twice because I wasn't satisfied with where I was going. And I've been fired twice. Um, I think uh, I've probably worked on my resume seriously five or six times. And actually, I worked on it, I always had it on my computer and would work on it whenever I thought I needed to, just in case. It was like checking my parachute, okay? You want your resume up to date. I've interviewed hundreds of candidates for jobs, important jobs, hired, I've fired. Uh, one of the companies I worked for for a number of years was a big stodgy oil company. You just kind of fit in and worked along. Probably the most interesting 
part of my career, though, was with, with New Skin Enterprises in Provo, which was a startup company, not very old at the time. And we scrambled every day to try to reinvent that company to make it grow. Today, it's, I think its uh, market cap on Wall Street is $1.5 billion. I didn't get to participate in all of that, but uh, uh, that was a great experience. And I think another thing I would share with you is I have, my wife and I have been involved in the BYU degrees of 14 of us, our children, or us too. And, and so we know a little bit about the opportunity of BYU and what it can mean in your life and about the choices you should be making. And that's what I want to talk about today. The opportunities that are yours and, 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 and the choices that you really ought to be considering. I want to talk today about continually qualifying yourself and just give you some suggestions, not out of a book. This is just my personal experience in my career. Uh, you're probably all, maybe a few exceptions, members of the Church of Jesus Christ. And you're living here on the earth in the latter days. What you do in your career and what you, what you do today in your studies matters. It matters a great deal. It matters so much that the First Presidency invests heavily in your education. You know all about that. If you remember the church, tithe payers from the widow that gives $10 in tithing a month to someone who gives hundreds of thousands a month, willingly pay for probably two-thirds of your education. And they're happy to do that because you will change the world. You will prepare the earth for the coming of the Savior, which will happen, let me speculate, we shouldn't, but I will. If it doesn't happen in your lifetime, probably will in your kids. It's at the door, we know that. Joseph Smith told us that, and uh, things are moving at a fast pace, and you're badly needed. You need to qualify yourself. Let me tell you about the world of opportunity that is yours. There's a lot of confusion about what's, is there a chance that I can get a job? The economy's down here in the United States. Is that, is that working? Why did it come on? We don't know. <laughs> Yeah, I... The gecko's in the wall. Whoa, look at that. Here we go. Let's see if we can get this thing going here. Okay. Let, let's see if we can make that work. Okay. Well, now, now that we've... Let's turn some lights down here. Let me, let me get back on track. First of all, you, there's a job fair on the 8th, right, Brother Tanner? And that will be your class period that day. Yep. Is that correct? Yep. So from 10 a.m. to 1, you're all expected to be there. Come and support that. Meet people, network, and so forth, okay? Okay, we've talked about this. Qualifying yourself, and I want to emphasize that you need to qualify yourself continually. This is not something you just do here, but you've got to get it into your head that you need to start qualifying. Think in terms of qualifying yourselves. And it's a process that you're going to do throughout your life. If, if you become a homemaker for a period of time and you're raising your family, uh, you still can't stop qualifying because your skills are needed at every place you turn. In any event, your education is important to that qualifying. And uh, let's talk about that. I want to talk about the opportunities that are yours. The economy in the United States, and is even maybe even more so in the Pacific Rim, throughout Asia, and the rest of the world, is continuing to shift to a college economy. Those who don't have college degrees are being pushed down and out of what we call in the United States the middle class. The number of jobs available to people without college degrees is diminishing. A college degree becomes, is becoming essential. Uh, by 2018, the U.S. will need 22 million new college degrees, but will fall short by 3 million. This will be lost economic opportunity for Americans. These jobs will probably shift to Asia, and that's great. 
for most of you, okay? But the point is, where, where they go is maybe not so important, but the opportunity is there. But it does matter what you study, okay? Um, a college degree in and of itself does not solve the problem. You deciding what it is you need to do to, to, to meet the needs of this thirsty world is, is your responsibility, and you need to take that on and, and be worried about that today in your studies. Let's just take, for example, example you all carry iPods. I've seen you with them. Um, or iPhones. It, as, as we used to, when I was growing up, the value added in a product was generally sort of on the manufacturing floor. It was at Ford Motor Company there in the, in the bolting together and the building of the cars where most of the value added took place. Today, that's not the case. For the iPod, most of the work that adds value to that iPod is done in the second bullet point here by design, marketing, finance, and management people. Only 20% of the value added is done in the manufacturing process. That's because the skills that make these fantastic products have become so much more important to the success of the product and the manufacturing has become so much easier that those who work on the production floor are less and less in demand. Does that make sense? Okay. Let's look at another one. There's a trend. We've had a big recession in the United States and in the Western world. That continues. It's beginning to come around maybe. But what's happened here, the emerging markets, as it says in the first bullet point, will grow strongly despite the financial crisis. The global recession will hasten the shift of economic power from the West to emerging markets. Those of you that somehow get it into your head that your only opportunity is to go to the mainland, I'm speaking of those of you who are international students, it's just not true. There is a wave moving across Asia and you need to get in front of it, just like surfers do down on Sunset Beach. You need to be ahead of it. The opportunities are huge and uh, evolving quickly. And if you're, if you're acquiring or qualifying yourself, acquiring skills, you'll be able to catch that wave. Let's, uh, let's just talk for a second here about what you should be doing here on campus, okay? I'm not, if, you, if you don't write another thing down here today, write this down. If you're a freshman, you need to purposely be selecting your major. We'll talk more about this, but you, 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 this, this is up, to, up between your first days here and 30 credit hours. You should be spending time on research and understanding what, the, what qualifications you need for the new world. And I'm not saying what you should study, but you should be finding out and making a deliberate decision. It is so sad to meet with you on campus, and, and I often ask you when I meet you at the PCC or wherever we are, what are you studying? And then I say, what are you going to do with it? And most of the time you say, I don't know. That's a bad answer. You may not know exactly what the future holds, but you should have some sense that will give you direction. And you do that through research, prayer, consulting with parents, and other people in your large network at home so that you can make a purposeful decision about what you're going to study. It may not be perfect. It may not be right the first time. But you need to do that very early. The, the campus is now limiting your time here to nine semesters. Those don't have to be sequential. But nine semesters doesn't leave you any time to fool around. You've got to get on with it. And especially for degrees that sort of those high qualifying degrees, there's work to be done here and you need to get started soon. Okay? 
Let's talk about juniors. When you're, you're at to 60 credit hours, you need to be securing an internship. An internship is not just a, a nice little thing that you do on, on, on a summer vacation. An internship is needed, and I know you've, some of your majors require internships. You, that responsibility is yours, and you need to be finding that internship through your networking, your professors, some of your majors provide this opportunity in a more automated fashion. Others require a lot of effort on your part. And so, when you cross that 60 hour threshold, boom, you're out there digging and scratching to find that internship that fits your goals, okay? Seniors, when you cross that 90 credit hour threshold, you should be actively looking for a job, okay? This is not something you do when you go home. Many, many students with effort have secured their degree, secured their, their first employment before they get on the plane to go home. That should be your goal, that I'm going to have a job before I leave here, okay? And it's possible. Corporations, many companies and so forth around the world understand that and they will start looking for you to start work in August after you graduate, they'll start looking for you many times in April and May, and even earlier, January. We need to be there as they're looking. Career Services is here to help you with this, but it's primarily your responsibility, and, uh, and you can succeed at that. So, thir up to 30 hours, you're securing your minor, or excuse me, your major your, as a junior, you're finding that internship so that you have a more profitable junior year. And by, as seniors, you start. Your resume's up to date. We're working with you on that, and you're out selling yourself. You're securing that, that job. That's what, th this is not just so that you can be making money. It's so that you can get on with the great mission of your life, <coughs> the things that Heavenly Father has for you to do. It matters. It really does. So I hope that you can engage in that, and I'm others here are happy to help you in that process. Let's, let's see what, what, we've read some of this before. President Hinckley, get all the schooling you can to qualify yourselves in your chosen vocation. In this world, competition is terrible. It eats up people, it destroys many, but it must be faced. It's something with which we have to deal. Where, where does that competition come from? That he says, that President Hinckley says we've got to learn to deal with. Where does it come from? Each other. Each other? How, though? There's a lot of reasons. Sometimes, sometimes markets change and so forth. But, but, but a lot of this competition comes from the changing in the skill sets, the qualifications that you need. So you must be qualifying continually in order to compete. I just want to underscore that. President Hinckley tells us this. In this good old world of ours, you've got to be on top of it. And you start now. What is it I need to do to qualify and to compete? Okay? It isn't, it isn't, it can't all be described as, you know, I just sort of like that. Yes, President Hinkle will tell us here in a minute that we ought to find out what our aptitudes and our interests and our, where we'd like to spend our lives in, our, in the world of work, but it's more than that. You've got to compete at the same time. Okay? All right. Today, today we're in a we're in a situation where we, we used we used to say, oh, when I got out of college, we'd say, oh, I got a job with IBM. I'm set. <laughs> well, I've had 12 positions and five jobs. I can tell you that's not the case. You aren't set. Any company in this world only has one obligation. It's this. When we make money, we will give you a paycheck. When we stop making money, you will not get a paycheck. And it ends right there. That's the realities, okay? And so you need to compete. 
Um, we used to think to ourselves, oh, but this, I love this company. It has a great retirement package, and that's great. But it's almost like now, brothers and sisters, we need to be saying to ourselves, I'm actually more attracted to a job that enhances my skill set, that builds my qualifications, and makes my resume better. That's like self-reliance. That's like church welfare system, the, the che teaching principles of welfare, okay? If you're going to take care of yourself, you're responsible to yourself and your family to keep your qualifications up. If you've got a resume that says you can compete and offer skills, then you're less likely to be left without work and to be able to provide. I, I think it was the general president of the Relief Society, I don't want to misquote her, but uh, somebody in the Relief Society president mentioned the other day in Tucson that, that there's a very high percentage that sisters who decide to, to stay at home and have always intended to raise their children at home, there's about a 90% chance that at some time in their lives they are going to have to provide completely for their families alone. It's a huge percentage. And so, sisters, it's not, not something that, that, that you can just kind of do on the side that maybe can help the family out. You, there's a very high likelihood, sisters, that you will be saddled with the whole thing yourself during certain periods of your life. Hopefully not for long, but it happens. And you need to have qualifications to prepare you for that. As you look at your major and the things that you're studying, Think outside the box a little bit. Does it have the flexibility? Could maybe I work at home in this computer age? Could I work part time and maybe earn more per hour than I would in some other qualified area? All things that you need to be thinking about, sisters, as you make this decision too. Well, Here's President Hinckley again. Choose something that will be stimulating, thought-provoking, and that will carry with it the day-to-day -day opportunity to do something to improve society of which you will become a part. And we believe that maybe more than anybody. And so uh, I, I, those of you who are trying to kind of come in contact with yourself and understand where your skills, skills are and your talents and your... And your, uh, and your and your desires. Uh, you probably, many of you have taken the Focus 2 test that's here on campus and here in the Career Center. We can help you with that. I think that's available to everyone, isn't it? And to help you understand that just a little better. Let's go on with President Hinckley. In choosing a vocation, you should bear in mind that there are other things in life that are of tremendous importance also. The greatest task of all, the greatest challenge, the greatest satisfaction lie in rearing a good family. We, we've, the, the prophets have said to us that the greatest work, the greatest success we'll have in life is in our family. And I, I hope that our ambitions are not so much that we get that turned around. I told you before that my career and with, with, with the teachings of prophets have made me very rich, not in terms of money, there's been sufficient for us to raise our family, to have some fun times, to, to uh, help our children where they needed it, and now for us to set an example for our grandchildren on missions ourselves. But no, we're not rich financially. Just enough, maybe not quite enough. But we are rich because Heavenly Father has taken that career plus the following of the teachings of prophets, and he has guided us by consistently paying our tithing and focusing on our family first, we have become rich in the things of eternity. And I want to add to that, that Heavenly Father has, has blessed us to be able to serve in amazing ways to build the kingdom. And, and I hope that's your prayer and your priorities. 
Those of you who have come from outside the United States have come here on the understanding that you'll go home. Don't lose sight of that. That's what President Monson wants you to do. There you will be blessed and you will prosper if you'll do what you're asked to do. Just as I've learned in my life, you will be a success. As we look at, at, at the last sentence here, there must also be time for service in, in the church. As Sister Henderson and I have lived in Argentina, Africa, Middle East, one, and you may, some of you may know this firsthand as you've, been, you've left some of the branches of the earth uh, in your homeland, that standing in a position of leadership myself and being given the responsibility to ask Heavenly Father who the next branch president should be, in some cases who the next Relief Society president could be, there wasn't anybody. Tragically, there was no one. And the reasons are interesting. Actually, there were returned missionaries in the branch and in the ward. The problem is that, that, that husband and wife were working so hard to provide for family that they were never in church on Sunday. Their qualifications were such that they never allowed them to take the kids and go to church on Sunday. And therefore, we're not going to be able to build the way that maybe they could. You're here acquiring skills and qualifications so that you can find yourself in the job market and not, not be in that position. Some have jobs that, that are just so demanding and, and so much expected of you time-wise that there's no time to play with children. No time to have come home on family night exhausted so tired that you can't have family home evening. That will not work. And here, now, at BYU, you can change that. By researching what, what, what the marketplace is in your home country, what the opportunities are there, and acquiring those skills so that you don't have to find yourself in a situation to where you're having to make such huge sacrifices that your family and your service are compromised. I, I know what Heavenly Father wants, and He will bless you with that challenge. He will. The time to think about it's right now. Prayerfully, you'll have answers to that. You know, I don't want to spend time so much here today on talking about, uh, about how you make that decision. There's, there, we have folks at the career set, uh, office here that can help with that, and there's testing and so forth that can help you think that through. But the responsibility, again, is yours. The internet, a network of friends that you can email back home, asking the questions about what, what are the opportunities for this particular skill set back home and so forth. You need to be digging and wondering, and you should be asking about pay. What will it pay? This is an issue that, uh, that you will come head to head with very soon. Some skill sets pay here, some don't. You need to know. Don't just guess. It's some, there's plenty of information out there. You can research that and find out. OK. Um, but the important thing is you need to decide. And you can. Don't be afraid. Make the best decision you can on your knees and working at it as hard as you can. And the Lord will bless you that you can make a good decision. Well, I wanted to take the rest of the time here and just share with you some personal experience about con continually qualifying or differentiating yourself. I, I have found over the years that there are things that you can deliberately do that make you very competitive. No matter what your choice of career or, or uh, your major might be, your, 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 your work, your field of work in the future, starting now through years of college and on out into your, your, uh, your time in, your, in the workplace, 
you're continually looking for ways to differentiate yourself and to increase your qualifications. Let me just give you a few ideas. This is not, this is not a complete list, but just some things that I think have made a big difference in, 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 in my life and in the life of my children and Sister Henderson and those that, that we've worked with. When you make that choice about what it is you're going to study, brothers and sisters, you, you, you need to become passionate about it. It isn't just getting through the exams and the homework it is not enough. You, you need to become more of a spokesperson for that major. You need to already become an expert. And you can. In some ways, you're closer to the information than you will be once you start work and you're so busy doing whatever it is you do there. Now, you can actually get closer to knowing about your major, your field of study. Take advantage of that and become passionate about it. When, when a professor offers extra credit opportunities or there are forums, times to get together in study groups and so forth, become interested in what you're doing. It wasn't so many years ago that Sister Henderson was studying speech therapy. I watched as, as those, now I had been out of school for some time, Sister Henderson was, was, was specializing in, 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 in teaching children how to speak. And as the ladies would gather around and talk about their assignments and their projects, it was exciting to see their excitement about the things they were learning and how children would be changed and blessed by what they were doing. We need to become passionate about what it is we study. When, you, when I conduct an interview for somebody who wants a job, it's easy to tell who's passionate and really interested in what it is that this job entails, okay? You may not be totally qualified, but your enthusiasm will make up for it. Sometimes, if we look around, there is a road less traveled that we ought to maybe look at, and it gives us that edge. Let me give you an example. Sister Henderson, has always loved teaching children, and she's very good at it. Her desire was to be involved in the, in the teaching of primary children. But as she looked at that, which was a noble and a great opportunity to become a teacher in a primary school, she noted that, uh, that there were several specialties there that were very in high, very high demand. And one was speech pathology. She put in literally the same amount of time to get her master's degree as a regular teacher would, but she came away with something. She took a road that was a little less traveled. And, and that road has meant a great deal. If Sister Henderson and I, if we had to go to work today because she chose speech therapy or speech pathology, she's far more employable than I am because her skills are in such high demand. And she can work almost anywhere in the world she wants. The demand is so high. She got it done in the same time that the others did. But it made a difference. She chose that, and, and she, again, has the fulfilling experience of seeing little children who can now pronounce and talk effectively. And uh, that has been a great blessing in her life. But she chose, in this case, a road that was a little less traveled. <coughs> Certifications are a way to, to differentiate yourself. And uh, we talked to, here, we helped bring SAP to the campus. There are others. There's CFA, I think. And uh, I know in the education department there are other certifications. Take advantage of these. As you meet with your advisor, see if you can't work qualifying for these certificates. They make a great difference on your resume. You know, today, when resumes come into a company or into a, an educational uh, uh, department, they, they, they will scan these resumes and then do word searches. And they know the key words. A lot of times these certifications are the words that uh, they look for. And they'll make your resume come up out of 1,000 and you'll be the top 15 or 20. 
I've got two sons that did this in different ways, and it is blessed. Their, their certifications have made all the difference in the world. I mean, it's just I wish I had time to tell you how much it catapulted them into, into their career. And that's part of the reason of the work here today on, on, on SAP, is to see if we can't, can't help with that. Uh, another one. And I know this gets said all the time. It doesn't seem to matter what it is that you're studying. Technology is a way for you to differentiate yourself. Technology is changing the way we do everything. And I, I just, just let me just give, give you some examples. There are more smartphones in the world today than there are toothbrushes. That's hard to believe, isn't it? Okay. What that has done to the world is something that you and I can't even hardly get our heads around. That has meant that in, 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 in northern Africa, where people never took their money to a bank, whole populations are now banking. What did that mean to the banking industry in those countries? It's huge, okay? Mobile technology is more likely, is more likely to help business than any other technology. It's a game changer. Companies all over the world are scrambling to figure out what to do with the iPhone because they know it's a game changer and if they go to sleep on it, they're going to be left behind. Market share and so forth. And in, 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 in terms of just about anything you can imagine, the world of mobility is changing our world. Okay. Here's, here's, here's a statistic. Every, for every 10 additional mobile phones, per 100 people results in a 0.8% increase in GDP in that population. The, the, just because more cell phones are out there, the productivity, we could say, or the output of that economy increases substantially. I want Sister Henderson to show you something here. This is the speech therapist here. And if you have trouble talking, she can help you. <laughs> well, in the schools, um, we're using technology also because it just makes us so much pro more productive. We can teach the children faster, and they can learn faster and more effectively. Now, for this, I would be teaching a child to sequence. Sequence is putting events into order, and I'm using here three events. They need this skill for reading for a lot of things, but I would usually work with children who uh, have challenges, maybe learning challenges, and I used to buy boxes of materials and books and all that, and now for just a few dollars I can buy a little program and the child will learn so much faster and are so much more engaged. So here we're teaching... You're one three, on, right? One on, or two or three, okay. teaching three steps, okay? Put the on. cards in order. Okay, it says put the cards in order. Um, the first is waiting to hit the ball, the second is hitting the ball, and the third is ready, ready to bat. So I would, I would tell the children, okay, which one do you think comes first? And he would pull that down. Oh, it was the wrong one, and so it goes back to its place. Um, could it be he's ready to bat? No, should be. <laughs> there it is. And it rewards him with a little applause. He got that right. Okay, the second one be, would be waiting for the ball. And the third would be hitting the ball. Okay, and then I can go on to the next one. Okay. So as you can see, he, uh, this child and I can just do thousands of repetitions because we're using a computer. And the child's growth and retention, do you think it's faster? Oh, yes, yeah, so much faster. And my time and my energy in trying to plan and prepare these materials and for either free or a couple of dollars, I can get them here. And then I just work so quickly with the child. They learn faster. What are we against? Do we have time? Uh, two or three more minutes, then maybe Q&A. Okay. So here's a mobile device, and... and uh, and this is being used in ways you, you've probably all seen interactive textbooks now on the iPad. Uh, 
and studies have shown that a student in college, wherever, learns far more effectively using these tools. So the point here, no matter what it is you're studying, you can create a competitive edge that maybe, maybe that will help you by understanding and getting involved in the technology of what it is you're doing. Some of you will say, oh, I'm not a per computer person, or I'm not this, or I'm not that. That just isn't true. If you will apply yourself, there are tutors here and such, this is something worth your attention. Internships, of course, give you an edge, and I could, I could tell you some great stories there. Don't miss that opportunity. And the last thing I'd say here is to aim high. You know, sometimes, sometimes we will talk and you'll say, oh, I just, me and math, I just, math's not my thing. You know, I, I would submit that that may be true for some, but I don't think it is for most. Math's always hard. Math's hard for everyone. I have a son that that's, has a PhD in electrical engineering, and we, he struggled with math like you can't believe, and he hated it. Today, you can't believe the stuff that he's doing, the amazing opportunity that's come to him, because he pushed through, and now math is his servant. He goes to the board and does all his Einstein stuff, <laughs> you know, because he wanted it, and he got it. So aim high. Don't, don't miss the opportunity of this, this schooling time by, by saying that somehow you just don't have the energy for it. You can succeed. You can be the best. <coughs> President Hinckley says, these are the great days of your preparation for your future work. Do not waste them. I hope that, uh, again, here at BYU Hawaii, that there'll be a deep sense of mission that mission will be tied to your testimonies and your understanding of what the Lord is doing in these the latter days. And that you play a great role there. Heavenly Father has blessed me so much. I have been made so rich in terms of blessings to my family and to my opportunities to serve and to build His kingdom because I worked hard at qualifying myself. I pray you'll do that, and I pray it in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Do you have questions? We're about out of time. John, John. Any, any questions? Can you repeat it too, sir? Any questions? Yes? I think probably the most stimulating was product development. Um, starting with very little, kind of a concept of what we thought the customer needed, getting a team of people around that were experts in chemistry and packaging and marketing, and shutting ourselves into a room for four or five days at a time with 7-Up and popcorn and pizza, and creating a miracle. Yep, the Steve Jobs deal. That's fun, yeah. So you talked about uh, education and like the new, call it like a college economy, and stuff like that. What do you think about the trend uh, away from uh, this kind of establishment education, like brick and mortar education? I don't know. I know it's happening. You know, I, I'm not an expert on that, but I, I, it's, it's inevitable, you know, uh, the, the, the experience that can be provided online. Education costs so much money. I mean, your, your degrees, I, I wouldn't, your tens of thousands of dollars for your degree, it should, obviously we can't go into the future this way and something's got to change. Bring it closer to home. I, I don't, I, I can't answer that question. I don't know. Uh, why'd you quit two jobs and why were you fired from two jobs? <laughs> Uh, well, let's see if I can do it in 50 cents. Uh, the, one, one was because there was an opportunity to make more money over there. 
it was a risk. And, and, and probably Sister Henderson had a heart attack in the process. But I cut the cord and went with the other one. Okay? Another one, another one was uh, I just didn't feel it was the best place for me to be. And uh, being fired, you get fired because sometimes uh, one, of the, one of those cases I was fired in was because of a deep misunderstanding. I probably partly my fault to take responsibility for it. And uh, I was shown the door. And what do you do then? You pick yourself up, learn from, from, the, from the experience, and don't, don't make the mistakes again, and go forward. Anything else? Yes? What were you doing product development for? I was involved in product development at New Skin Enterprises in Provo. We were developing uh, mostly creams, skin creams, and cosmetics. And vitamins? And vitamins, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Anything else? One more question. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.